I, I thought my uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation, 21st century journalism, because that's basically what we're into now. All right, uh, American journalism has spent a century establishing some pretty bad habits, right? And one of the reasons why this conversation, one of the reasons why I'm here, is because we're now on the cusp of a new century for journalism. We're living through a time when media is undergoing some gut-wrenching changes. We've all lived through those changes. We've all lived through downsizing. We've all lived through uh, being made superfluous in our, in our own staffs. We've all had to redefine ourselves as journalists. Um, my first day in college, uh, the, the journalism department at Humboldt State University in Northern California was one of the first to upgrade to IBM Selectrics, right? And then quickly uh, came the, uh, uh, the word processors. And now um, we're faced with not only technological changes, but demographic changes and, and audience changes that are affecting the core of what we do. But there's one thing that we have forgotten. Um, uh, in this is that we have audiences. We have audiences and we also have responsibilities to be news producers that follow an audience. And that carries some real fundamental ethical um, points that need to be brought into the conversation. So my prezi said, I mean my presentation is five slides. I'm going to talk in and around them. Um, I can make it available to you. It has a bunch of hyperlinks that takes you to the source material of the points I'm going to present. But these are points that I just want to make and highlight so we all know the, the foundation of what this conversation has to be all about. And you can see that some of the statistics are pretty frightening for us as journalists. Half of readers 18 to 29 often get news online compared to 20% of readers over age 65. What does that represent? We've inverted the entire way we have to present news. And unfortunately, mainstream media and legacy journalism, legacy journalists, the management of those institutions has not caught on. And the problem with this statistic here, the 18 to 29 going online, is that many, if not most, of the online, the powerful and the most dominant online organizations are still run by the people who, and I'm going to cuss, who fucked up legacy journalism, who fucked up mainstream media. They're now working in the nonprofit space. They're now working in the online space. Did they learn this lesson of the diffusion of our audience? No, because they've never gotten out of their own space, right? Only two of 10 adults turned to newspapers. When I started, newspapers was the place to go. That's where we all went. That's how we designed our early careers. Mine, 35 years ago, uh, when they, you had to go to a newspaper. And my goal was to work at the Washington Post or the New York Times. And proudly, I've turned both of them down for work in my 35 years because it was just not the right place for me to be. Um, local outlets, outlets now dominate the top commercial news uh, websites across the country in the top 100. And you can go to that list. And you'll see the usuals. You'll see HuffPost, you'll see the New York Times, CNN, and all these others. But surprisingly, once you get into the guts of that list, they're all local. And what's that telling us? Is that as communities, we want to talk to, we, to, to ourselves. We need to know about ourselves. And that's what mainstream media and legacy media has forgotten, that local matters. Local runs the show. And what I'm all about these days is finding that magic, that secret sauce that helps us talk to ourselves as communities. Even if it means having a billion websites, a billion news sites, we need to find a way to be able to represent communities, represent our communities. If we're not hearing our voices emanating from traditional or even now the emerging online websites, Let's do it ourselves. The technological barriers no longer exist. 
what exists is the barriers of understanding, of proper, oh, I, I say proper, but that, that, that's even subject, uh, a, a subjective word, uh, of good journalism background, of ethical training in journalism, which is most important. For me, the key word to a successful journalist and the best journalism is accuracy. Because when you hear someone say that, oh, you must be objective to be a journalist these days, that's never been the case. That's a BS line, if ever, if ever there was one. Why? Because we're human beings. And human beings by nature are subjective. Everything we do is subjective. So, in legacy media, in mainstream media, subject, subjective decisions decide what news is gonna be covered, what the headline is going to say, the angle of the article, the words chosen to craft an article, a story, that's all subjective. So my driving point is always accuracy, which leaves room for activist journalism, which leaves room for community journalism, which leaves room for journalism with a point of view. My, th my, clear, my thing has always been, hey, you can take a stand, and you can say what you want to say and be an activist about it, but be right. And be open to the challenge of your accuracy. So that, and, and that, and, and, uh, that really means that we have to be transparent in our work and be willing to show how we arrived at a certain point of view or a certain set of facts, okay? Um, so you go through this and you see that, uh, that even in broadcast, I spent a few years um, at NPR, and my origins are actually my first jobs were in radio. Um, the NPR is no longer the single player on the, in this field. Uh, you see now that we even have things like uh, PRI and um, American Public Media, and at least 500,000 podcasts that feature some kind of news. So it's this mass diffusion of the message. Um, but in this mass diffusion, as professional journalists, what's happened? Since the days of the front page and get me rewrite and all of that great stuff, these are the statistics today. African Americans, 5.3% of newsroom staffs. Latinos are 5.44%. Asians, 4.25%. And it's worse for Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, and according to ASNE, ASNE still calls them Native Americans, at 0.39%. So with this kind of representation, how do you think we're gonna be reflected in the mainstream media? Very poorly. How do you think we're going to be accepted as professional journalists? It's a cold day. And I point out the one thing I'm gonna show you here is why this is important to me. And let me find this here. Let's go to that. I wrote this piece for, uh, double click. That's it. Oh, it says can't find the internet server or proxy server. Oh, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an essay I wrote for Neiman reports at Harvard University <clears throat> that uh, is headlined, um, Still an Outsider in Mainstream journalist, Journalism. This was prompted by the election in 2016. And um, I, I, was in, I was asked to do this by the folks at, at Neiman reports to talk about what it's going to be like to be a Latino journalist um, in the age of Trump, right? And so I explained in that essay that, um, you know, it's kind of hard to walk into a situation when you're already considered a bad, a, a bad hombre and a rapist and anything else you might want to, pejorative you might want to think about as far as an immigrant goes. Um, so we, we were off to a, a handicapped start in that respect. And I outlined in that essay what my own history has been like in journalism, 35 years, I would say quite successful. I mean, I've won pretty much every award in journalism, as short as the Pulitzer Prize, but I've also been responsible for a couple of Pulitzer Prizes, which has been pretty cool. Um, 
And uh, what I outline in this, in this essay is that um, my experiences have been phrases like, oh, we already have a Latino on our staff. Or there's already a Latino in, um, in the business section, so why, why, why do we need another one? I didn't know we had quotas. Um, once we've hired you, now that we've hired you, we can make a normal hire. These are all words, I, phrases, and sentences I've heard in my 35 years. And some of these were uttered by friends and people, colleagues who I thought, uh, who I felt pretty close to. Um, so, you know, I go back to the days when uh, there were even fewer of us in the newsroom that, than there are today. Uh, so it's been sort of a, lo a lonely existence. Um, but it's also pushed me to fight for change in all of this, which is what drove my time as the head of the Fund for Investigative Journalism for six years as the president of that board of directors. We doubled the amount of money that we gave out, and we started diversity, um, diversity grants to uh, journalists of color, uh, and primarily to pursue investigative projects that might not otherwise see the light of day. I was called out by the Daily Caller and by Breitbart for that. And I said, you know what? Bring it on because this is a conversation I'd love to have with you or anybody else who wants to talk about this. Because if you're looking at a subset of American journalism that's even less represented in those numbers than in those numbers that I put up earlier, it's investigative reporting. Investigative reporting is the last bastion of, excuse me, of the white male journalist. And why? Because it has always been a feeder system where you hire a person, you bring along the person that you're most comfortable with. You train those young reporters who you are most comfortable with. What I call the barbecue factor, the, the kinds of journalists that you're looking forward to have that set, having that Saturday barbecue with. Um, and if you are not of that group, it is really difficult to crack that community and get into that community. Even now, 35 years later, I still feel like an outsider. I still feel like I can't, like it's gonna cost me a little bit of extra work to get my point across. Like it's a, and as I say point out in this essay, is that the margin for error for us is a lot thinner. The reasons for not advancing are far greater. And as my friend Howard Bryant says in his uh, current book about Af uh, African Americans and political activism, we have to be twice as good, which unfortunately is a brass tracks truth. So that's the, the, you know, the nub of what, I'm, what I talk about in this presentation, which, uh, uh, let's see, let's make this big again. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. And um, where'd you go? Here we go, presenters. All right. Um, let's go through some more of these statistics so you can see. Um, which takes me to my solutions. The solutions aren't easy. Um, and they will take time and patience to get at some substantial change. Why? Because, as I said at the beginning, the group of people who ran legacy uh, news operations, who ran the mainstream media when newspapers ruled the day, are now running the show at nonprofits and online news sites. There's a gradual demographic and generational change going on, and they are being slowly replaced. But the problem is that the people they bring are bringing up are branded in the same kind of thinking that moved them along. So now it's, you know, it's that thing. You, you, you get along to get ahead, right? And so you don't get ahead by bucking the trend. You don't get ahead by calling bullshit in newsrooms. This asks a lot of Latino and African American journalists how long they last when they start calling bullshit in the newsroom. Okay? There are some good signs of change though, right? And in my mind, it comes to, through employment and recruiting and training. Beginning with recruiting and training. And training means going to 
colleges and high schools, like we do at the at Inside Climate News has begun a high school camp for environmental journalists. And we have set asides because I really want to make that. And even though I'm leaving ICM, this is actually my last day at ICM. <laughs> um, one of the legacies I hope I'm leaving behind is this, uh, this camp, involvement in this camp, and diversity, and a, a couple of diversity projects that we've set aside for journalists of color to pursue environmental justice stories in 2019, hopefully beyond, right? Um, what's the result of this training and of this new level of employment and looking at problems of employment? You get a better understanding of the problems in a community. And one of the best examples in my mind, and let's see if this works, is this. Uh, well, this is called the Chauncey Bailey Project. In Oakland, about a decade ago, an African-American journalist was killed by a, uh, a group in Oakland that, uh, that he was investigating for financial, financial mismanagement and other crimes. It shot, an American journalist shot on the street in an American city. What happened, what was the result? Journalists of color from 30 different news organizations in the San Francisco Bay Area got together and said, we're gonna continue his investigation. And we're gonna to try to figure out who was behind the assassination and what brought it about. The project found the killers. The project found corrupt Oakland cops who were working with the corrupt gang that authored the hit and did an amazing amount of investigative reporting behind this. They dropped their competitive um, uh, knee-jerk tendency and, uh, and formed a collective of investigative journalists, which set the state for stage and an example for collaborative journalism and the power of collaborative journalism. It fostered the emergence of a number of great investigative reporters of color who might not have otherwise gotten a shot, had gotten their shot, if they hadn't participated in the Chauncey Bailey Project. I was proud to have gotten the first $25,000 to get this project off the ground when I was with, uh, working with a Society of Professional Journalists that led to a major grant from the Knight Foundation to keep this thing going and, and sought it through to the end. That's an example of what happens when you focus your attention, your resources on a particular problem and what we can do with it. Um, another one would be, uh, let's see, wait a minute. Let's go back to this. You get things um, like at ICN, we've uh, written stories that focus on the, the threats to the First Amendment rights of protesters uh, at, that grew out of Sandy Rock the RICO charges that were filed against protesters at Standing Rock, the, uh, ch the charges that have been filed recently against the protesters in Louisiana. Uh, it's a major threat to our ability and our tradition of protest in the United States. The threat to um, communities of color in Norfolk through climate change. Um, it, <laughs> you know, you think about who's gonna be on the front line of the damaging impacts of climate change, it's usually communities of color. So new attention needs to be brought to that, and the best people to do it are folks from the community, from those groups who know who to go talk to, right? In St. Louis, these are local projects that were started by people in their own living rooms, not traditional journalists. Um, this is a local group of, uh, of uh, well, anyway, it's, it's about the, uh, the radioactive fire. It's in a community outside of St. Louis. It's been going on for some time now. And who started this was a housewife who was looking at this and saying, hey, there's a problem here. And lo and behold, she has cancer, identified a cancer cluster, and, and are tying it to this raging underground radioactive the fire of, of radioactive material not far outside of St. Louis. Richmond, California, what I love about this is project that was done by Reveal, uh, the Center for uh, Investigative Reporting on the Richmond housing problem. 
And it is, a, is an example of how you can exercise community journalism because not only did they have traditional investigative reporting brought to this project to identify the problems and the corruption behind this housing scandal, they invited poets, playwrights, and in this case, a couple of, uh, a trio of spoken word um, artists to, to, uh, to opine on this a little bit, let's see. This is based on a actual- This is where rodents and roaches are like family. Cause we share the same meals. Top ramen, cereal, Kool-Aid. It's no family complaints. Everything's enjoyed that we refrigerate and put in cabinets. We feel 30 below air, cracked windows. No heat for when Richmond wind blows. No AC to cool down the weather that makes us sweat. Neglect the only thing we get. Fungus disintegrating the walls. Bathroom sink replaced bathtub. Only place where I can wash my body. Everybody come through the door and said people who repair. Why elevators broken in a place made for people who are disabled? How can we use stairs when we roll the wheels of our chairs and lean our bodies on canes and walkers? No one is responsive. Feel like I'm talking to myself when help is asked to restore something as simple as a lock on the gate so I can feel safe. Never get any phone calls returned. Don't get to talk to anything more than a machine. This is home. It's not built for us to survive. I see barren hallways, broken cameras, uninvited guests. There's no service here. As if a sea of people were cast away on an island to fend for themselves, the weather outside is frightening. The absent God's ghost remains in its rightful place. A world ran by village rules. We exist only to survive. Accustomed to the law of the land, mind your business. Pay no mind to that body that just fell from the top floor the other night. Silence has become an ally to fear. The fear of being a victim. Like a sickness, the madness of this reality soaks into a simple statement better here than out there. I see Juanita, a double amputee bound to a chair, hand scarred not by surgery or disease, but by her own, and a door that a wheelchair wasn't made for. Every day she pushes through. Every day she pushes on, because this is home. Look at Mama Hall, 81 years young and still keeping a routine. Very eyes maintaining order with disorder, day in and day out. And if the proper authorities won't help, then they help themselves. Whether it be mice nesting in the walls, dope dealers in the halls, or prostitutes treating for a trip. These things take hold of what they can and fight for what they can. Cause this is home. With video cassettes are glued to the ceilings and the walls to keep the mice out. This is home. Where the people make their own. Ain't family, but they'll never be alone. Ain't nowhere else to go. And these old folks need a place, so they make space. And pray for tomorrow, cause tomorrow shows a new face. Tomorrow. I'll stop right there. You can continue to look. I'll make this, uh, this presentation available so you can get all these links and pursue them. The reason why I'm really impressed with that piece, that reveal included in, as part of its package, of its investigative package on the housing scandal in Richmond, is because it included the community. It reached out to talent that might not otherwise have ever come beyond and gotten beyond, out the, beyond the Bay Area had it not been for Reveal thinking, we need a different way to reach an audience. We need a different way to get at the kind of people who we need to see this story, which is a, a group of millennial readers from a particular community that had nothing to do with legacy media prior. So in my mind, that's how you have to mix it up these days, and you have to look for new ways of reaching out to new audiences. Um, and what is, is um, what's impressive about all this is that we are getting at what I call the solutions, right? And, and here I, I list some examples that you'll be able to go into and, and look at some specific things that are happening now that are getting in that, going in that direction, right? Training folks to be their own journalists. It's not an easy thing, and I'm not talking about citizen journalism. I'm talking about going down to high school levels and others and recruiting people who we see as talented and saying, hey, number one, do you want to be a journalist? Have you thought about that as a career path? It's not the same thing as the old days when you had to wear the press, the hat that said press on the side, right? And commit yourself to starvation wages for the rest of your life, like some of us did. It's different now. You can be your own journalist. Second, 
I hope and pray that we can get in there and recruit people into the STEM fields who will then also become journalists because the STEM field is another one of those areas where there is a dearth of us and there's a dearth of understanding of what STEM and what environmental journalism can do for our own communities. And it's also a source of some damn good stories. <laughs> so, at Inside Climate News, we have the summer camp for high school students. The Maynard Institute, working with Reveal, has a, a training program for young journalists, which is outstanding. The Fund for Investigative Journalism and our diversity uh, uh, grants that we make available. The, this is the investigative fund from the Nation Institute that has a Ida B. Wells Fellowship for Independent Investigative Reporters who have some outstanding uh, projects they may want to pursue. I'm a board member, I'm on the board of directors with the Ida B. Wells Society, which again is dedicated to training young journalists um, and journalists of color when it comes to learning the ins and outs of investigative reporting. Um, my thing is about dialogue, so I'm hoping that this has generated a few questions for you. And let's talk. All right, great. Thank you so much.